Hello, everyone. Um, we're going to get started. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Global Development, thank you for joining us here today for what promises to be an engaging conversation. I also wanted to acknowledge um, colleagues from around the world tuning in on our webcast. Welcome, everyone. I'm Janine Madan Keller, Assistant Director of CGD's Global Health Policy Program. The topic of today's event, um, issues of quality, affordability, and competition in medicines markets around the world, is something that my colleagues and I here at CGD have been thinking about a lot in the context of our work on global health procurement. These issues are inherently complex, especially as supply chains of medicines have become more global and interconnected. During today's event, uh, we'll have colleagues dissect the many dimensions of these challenges as we currently see them. More importantly, we'll also reflect on um, how to move forward on these issues, how to tackle these issues, and what role the global health community can play in charting the path forward. Um, we also invite you all, both here in the room as well as those online, to join in on the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag CGD Talks. And before I pass it on, I just wanted to make a quick plug uh, for an event that CGD is going to be hosting uh, on the eve of the upcoming high-level meeting on universal health coverage in New York. We'll be hosting an event on global health procurement, a favorite topic of us here at CGD, um, on Sunday, September 22nd at 5.30. So I hope those of you in New York will be able to join us. And there's more information on our website at cgdev.org. Before further ado, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Amanda Glassman. She's executive vice president here at CGD, and she's going to kick us off with some opening remarks. Thanks, Janine. OK. So I just want to kick off by uh, noting how important whoops, quality assured generics are to the achievement of universal health coverage, or even to make real progress. IQVIA estimates that the global pharmaceutical market will exceed one and a half trillion dollars by 2023. It's growing at about three to six percent a year. In a set of low and middle income countries that we have studied, uh, we find that countries are spending about 50 billion a year, so a small share of that total. But most disease, the great majority of disease burden, is located in low and middle income countries. So I guess. It tells us a lot about how important expanding medicines access are in those countries. And in low middle income countries, spending on medicines is high as a share of total spending on health, and it is higher as a share of total spending on health than in high income countries. So it's a really important lever to try and reach greater affordability. And it also means that this is a big business, whether you're talking about originator medicines or generics medicines. And it's particularly important because although total health expenditure is growing, it is not growing as fast as pharmaceutical spend. Um, and there's more people and more services that we'd like to provide through our health systems. And affordable medicines in the form of quality assured generics are just an essential piece of the puzzle for figuring out how to get that done. In our work, we looked at uh, how low and middle, some low and middle income countries were spending their medicines budgets. What we found is that they tend to procure more branded generic drugs than unbranded generics, and, and less generics in general than high income countries or higher income countries, um, both in terms of value and volume. And we'll distribute these slides afterwards so you can have a closer look. We also found that medicines markets in low and middle income countries are not particularly competitive in the provision of essential medicines. So this is just a chart that shows what share of uh, sales of these particular uh, medicines uh, is from a single supplier in the country. Now, this could be a result of a number of, of phenomenon. It could be that there aren't other suppliers in the country. It could be that uh, governments uh, award a winner-takes-all approach in their procurement contracts. But whatever the explanation is, what we see is a huge dependence on a single supplier for uh, given products, which might, which might be behind some of the very high prices that we see in low middle income country markets for both branded and unbranded generics when we compare them to high income markets. So that's kind of the problem to solve here. Generics are supposed to be about greater affordability, but in the aggregate, when we look at some of these 
um, medicines, with the exception, I might say, of some of the medicines that are procured internationally that we'll talk about, this is a big issue. Today we're focusing on medicines quality. Um, I think uh, some of the best things I've read about it come from UN US Pharmacopeia. I don't know if someone is from that organization here. I hope that they're online. Um, but they help us to think about, well, what are the dimensions of medicines quality that we need to track? One piece of it is falsified medicine. There's also counterfeit medicines, which is a separate issue, okay? But Bottle of Lies, the book we'll talk about today, is really about falsified medicines, fraudulent manufacturing and data, um, modifying levels of active ingredient, change bioavailability profiles. There's lots of technical issues here, but that's one category. Substandard, those are unintentional er uh, errors in manufacturing, and then degraded. And I think the, the thing, the, 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 just to, I, I forgot to mention earlier, when we see the purchase of branded generics in a lot of countries or on-brand originators where there are generic substitutes available in low- and middle-income countries, one of the big hypotheses that we have is that governments and people are buying those medicines because they are conceived, they're considered to be of higher quality. Okay, so that's, there's an issue of trust in the way that they purchase medicines in those countries as well. So we need to be very vigorous in the, in the regulation of essential medicines. That said, it's very hard to say what is the global estimate of this problem. So we'll hear about a story about one company, mainly one company, its relationship to some others. Um, but it's hard to say overall. But in some literature views that have gone on, it shows that the presence of falsified substandard or degraded medicines is fairly significant, that there are costs in terms of death and disease, and that it leads to serious drug resistance issues. And I would say that it is not only a low and middle income country phenomenon, nor only India and China. Um, and there's a very good uh, article that talks about, basically in the, in the literature that's been published to date and with all the caveats about what is published and in the public domain, but about 56% of these uh, high prevalence cases are coming from developing countries but the rest are coming from high income country manufacturers. So just to, you know, we'll talk today about an Indian company, but it's not just India. I'm gonna skip this. I wanted to mention before we start something about what global health programs do on medicines quality. And there are others that are much more qualified to tell uh, more about all the details of what they do. But I would say that the global health procurers like USAID and Global Fund have quite stringent medicines quality assurance processes uh, they choose pre-qualified WHO, they do pre-shipment quality control testing, and they do a lot of regulatory and lab strengthening. At the Global Fund, they also have an additional review of the dossier, and they mandate that principal recipients should conduct random quality control along the entire supply chain. And they've managed to align these standards across the Global Drug Facility, Unitaid, and Global Fund. So this is all good. There's still obviously much more to do, um, but I think the main... Uh, take home that one might say is that first that the that access to quality assured generics have been essential to the sustainability of global health programs so when we talk about problems with quality please do keep that in the back of your mind it is continues to be a process because this is a market where their incentives operating and the, the incentive to cut costs is high and sometimes quality suffers so we just have to keep our eye on the ball I think these are this is a good experience to think about the question is, what happens to the non-AIDS, TB, and malaria medicines? And what happens when countries move to procure mostly their own medicines without the global procurement mechanisms that provide some of this quality assurance? I think when I think about our future work, for me, this issue of safe medicines uh, and the supply chain is really a global issue that has implications for economies, health, security, and development. Um, the issues are quite complex. But what we can say is, you know, it doesn't really matter whether it's an originator or a generic product. There are incentives and markets operating everywhere. And whatever incentive that we create through our purchasing, whether we're public sector, whether we're large private insurers or whatever it might be, um, we are going to get what we pay for. So we better ask for what we want. And I think one of the things that we saw in our review of procurement is that the incentives for quality, for having multiple competitors in the system, um, and for supply security, are sometimes missing in procurement tenders, or we fragment procurement so much that we're not able to ensure those sort of longer-term agreements that are able to deliver on all three of those dimensions. 
And we could have a discussion about, okay, well, what, when, we, when we look at the United States, uh, maybe what we're seeing more of is the fragmentation of procurement and a lack of attention to supply security and the purchase of medicines. Um, I think you know, one other, when you read the book, well, I'll let uh, Catherine talk about it, the legal and regulatory frameworks that we have in a lot of low and middle income countries could be strengthened for sure, and it might require policy and legal reform. Um, and the, the other part that you see in global health and elsewhere is that there's somewhat of a silo between regulators, procurers, and providers where information is not necessarily flowing as quickly as we might like. But it seems like there's so many new technological innovations, we should be able to do this much better in the future. So finally, just to, uh, you know, I think this, this issue has been in the news lately. Um, in fact, this week uh, we saw uh, Bloomberg Business Week about generics manufacturing. We saw a stat piece that talks about why there should be public production of insulin. Uh, we saw a piece in The Economist about many generic drugs have too few manufacturers. That's one of the hypotheses that we were looking at in our report. And then uh, even uh, a fear that um, production is being uh, focused in certain countries. API mainly comes from China, and what are the implications? So it's in the news, and I think all of this goes to the point that we really need a very reasoned discussion so that we sustain the important role of quality assured generics in all of our health systems, uh, but we also pay attention to quality. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Catherine to tell us more about that. Thanks. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Center for Global Development for bringing me here today. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here, so thank you. Um, let me also say, uh, before we begin, let's go back here. Um, let me just put out that I believe that generics are essential to public health. Uh, they are a crucial public good. Um, I take them myself. <laughs> And we all, I think, in this room, what, wherever we're coming from, can agree that quality assured generics are essential. But with that, what I wanted to talk to you about today uh, is my reporting journey in Bottle of Lies. Um, because as an investigative journal, uh, journalist, I followed uh, the reporting where it led me. And the result is the book. Um, so first of all, the book is based on 10 years of uh, reporting on four continents, interviews with over 240 people, including numerous whistleblowers, uh, over 20,000 pages of internal FDA documents that I obtained, um, thousands of pages of internal corporate records from a number of generic drug companies, 16 freedom of information requests, uh, one of which wound up in litigation, awfully useful. Uh, and a number of magazine articles along the way. Um, and uh, this is what the New York Times had to say about the book. Um, Bottle of Lies is an invaluable expose, a reportorial tour de force, and a well-turned epic. So uh, my reporting uh, for this book started in 2008. Uh, I got a curious phone call, and of course, uh, journalists live for the curious phone call. Um, from the host of an NPR radio program called The People's Pharmacy. It was Joe Graydon. I'd been on his show several times before in my reporting. He said that he was inundated with patient complaints about generic drugs. Um, he's a pharmacologist by background. To him, the complaints um, were not without merit. Uh, and he brought them to the attention of the FDA. And basically, the message that he got back is that it was psychosomatic. Patients react when they see pills that are different in color and shape, and that really there was not an issue. Uh, but he posed a question to me. So he asked, what is wrong with the drugs? And I, this is uh, just a, my chicken scrawl, uh, the notes I kept from that first phone call with him, uh, honing my investigative skill of writing illegibly uh, so that nobody else could <laughs> understand them. Um, so I began reporting basically where he pointed me with the patients. Um, and a couple of things jumped out at me. Um, one was that the FDA's definition of bioequivalence has some space in it. Um, you know, it's a complex statistical formula. I spent more time than I care to say 
trying to really understand it, but the short version is this, that the FDA recognizes that, there, that generics will not be an exact copy. Um, they will be a sort of rough version in the sense that they might fall 20% below or 25% above the absorption into the blood of the, brand, of the innovator drug. Um, the medicine can have different ingredients, excipients, if the central molecule is the same. This really jumped out at me, that the FDA reviews company-generated data, but does not actually test the drugs. But this is what floored me. I went down to the FDA and sat around a conference table, and the head of the Office of Generic Drugs said to me, the approval system requires the ethical behavior of the applicant. Otherwise, the whole house of cards will fall down. And that left me feeling, what is going on here? Um, so my first article about this came out in June of 2009 um, in Self Magazine. And what was interesting to me is there was a group of doctors who really were aware of some issues. And they were doctors who prescribed narrow therapeutic index drugs, where dosing is where precise dosing is important. So the cardiologists, the psychiatrists, the endocrinologists all sort of knew what I was talking about and had concerns. So this quote came from the head of the American Psychiatric Association. The FDA is satisfied that generics are OK. My question is, are we satisfied? Well, it wasn't long after that uh, article came out that my real education began when I got this email from a source, a new source, calling himself $4 refill, which is, of course, what you pay if you go to a Walmart and refill your generics. And basically, he wanted to talk to me. And it was after speaking with him that I began to think about the topic a little differently. So these are statistics that are uh, sort of accurate more now than in 2008. But today, the US drug supply is roughly 90% generic. So you have a, like a 9 in 10 chance that you fill your prescription it's generic. The generic drug market in this country there's a lot of numbers out there. 104 billion was the one that kept coming up. But there was another issue, which is a deal sweetener that is in, was embedded into the generic drug market. The company that files first with the FDA got six months of exclusivity on the market as a generic, where they could um, sell their drugs at roughly 80% of the brand name price. That incentive had sparked this gold rush to the extent that there were literally little tent cities that sprouted in the FDA parking lot and companies that would send in stretch limos and their uh, employees would alternate sleeping overnight, all to be first in the door to file with the FDA. And as one company lawyer told me, minutes mattered. So <clears throat> as I was reporting, I heard about a company called Rambaxi which at the time was India's largest generic drug company, a household name in India and a real source of pride as one of the first big multinationals uh, in India. Um, but there was an investigation going on into Rambaxi and to a question of whether they had committed data fraud. And one of the things that I began to look at were some of the incentives to shorten the timeline, right? If you have to be first in through the door at the FDA, how do you get there most quickly? And so what if you were going to take this process, which is the process of development of a generic drug, and falsify it? So you could, for example, here would be a shortcut. You take the small pilot batches um, that you're testing, and you pass them off as your larger exhibit batches, and you present that data. Then I got my hands on what uh, I can only describe as a true smoking gun document. Uh, in the world of investigative journalism, there are a few documents that lay out a company fraud as clearly as this one did. Um, so this was a PowerPoint that was presented to a subcommittee of the board of directors, which basically laid out how the company had committed a global fraud. Uh, that there were elements of data in their applications that had been fabricated to support business needs, and 
that the filings, the fraud, affected more than 200 products in more than 40 countries. Okay, so we're talking about a global fraud. The PowerPoint had been assembled by this gentleman, Dinesh Thakur, um, who had, uh, uh, was a sort of information architect for Rambaxi and was tasked by his supervisor with trying to get to the bottom of what data was real and what was fake uh, in Rambaxi's global regulatory filings. And no longer able to sleep at night, in August of 2005, he sent a series of increasingly desperate messages to the FDA, which culminated in this one, which was effective, where he wrote to the FDA commissioner, I finally write to you to plead with you to put a stop to this crime. Um, my reporting on these issues and on uh, Rambaxi led to this 10,000 word Fortune Magazine article in May of 2013, which was the story of Rambaxi and Dinesh Thakur's journey. But I have to say that even, uh, you know, as an investigative journalist, you, you never really stop reporting and you never really feel like you're done. And even then, I had a question as to whether Rambaxi was uh, an outlier or the tip of the iceberg. And that is really the question that I felt was unanswered in my mind. Um, not long after that article came out, I got a very interesting communication from a source who worked as an FDA consultant. And basically that person said to me that they had concerns about what they called fast drugs. So for example, um, you go into a Gap or a Zara and you get a cheap t-shirt and you basically understand that the price is low because the shirt is made in a distant manufacturing plant, and that's a kind of how a globalized sort of fashion clothing system works. And what this consultant was saying to me is that exists for generic drugs, um, and there, we are getting cheap generics, and that there is a quality cost that we are paying for that, which is not to say they're all bad, which is not to say we can do without them, um, but to say that you know, there are quality distinctions here that we need to pay attention to. I began looking at the FDA's system of inspections overseas, uh, which I should say, that is where the majority of our low-cost generic drugs are being made overseas. That's why I was looking there, not out of any particular animus towards India or China, but simply that's where the plants are. And what I found, uh, the overseas inspections, unlike the domestic ones, are pre-announced. And sometimes the companies are given months of advance notice that inspectors are coming. There were numerous instances that leapt out of those 20,000 documents where diplomacy trumped public health. There were sterile manufacturing plants, and they wouldn't go in unannounced because they were concerned about the repercussions and creating an international incident. I had sources who were telling me the inspections are essentially staged and that the companies, some of them, are sending in data fabrication teams to alter documents, shred them, fabricate them in advance of the FDA arriving. Uh, and that this system had also a corrupting effect on the FDA inspectorate because the FDA was relying on the companies to book hotels, to arrange ground transportation, they were arranging uh, golf outings and trips to the Taj Mahal and dinners and hotel upgrades and luxury vehicles as pickups from the airport. Um, the book follows the story of one uh, FDA investigator, Peter Baker, who had a sort of unique system of inspections where instead of just uh, asking for printouts from the company, he looked in the computer systems. And in doing that, what he found, he was able to track metadata, which revealed that there were secret hidden tests that the companies, some of them, were operating um, uh, in order to get, to figure out how to get the desired results. And then they would move the testing to the main computer systems that the FDA would look at. Between 2012 and 2016, he inspected 86 plants 
in India and China and found some element of data fraud in 67 of them. So to me, this is telling me that uh, Rambaxi is not just an outlier and that there is uh, a serious problem of fraud in these plants. Um, so basically, the picture that emerged from my reporting was that there are companies that are essentially making, are not following good manufacturing practices, so they're making the lowest cost drugs and they're selling them into higher cost markets. Um, they're undercutting their own products for profit. Uh, they're using hidden laboratories, secretly repeated tests, and altered results. They are misrepresenting the drug quality through fake data and submitting that data in order to get approval from regulators. Here's a picture of one of these hidden laboratories where a manufacturing plant was running secret tests. Um, the other thing that I found, which is perhaps most disturbing, is that a number of the big exporting companies uh, are making lower levels of quality for what they call rest of world markets, and which make, essentially means that the manufacturing standard is whatever you can get away with. Where the regulation is less and the vigilance is less and the scrutiny is less, they're gonna use lower quality ingredients and fake data. And perhaps I'm asked in interviews, what is the most disturbing thing you found? Um, this was on a conference call that a Rambaxi executive had with colleagues uh, at Rambaxi. She raised her concern about the low quality of HIV drugs for Africa. A medical director of the company said to her, who cares, it's just blacks dying. So, um, uh, you know, this is absolutely not intended um, as a comprehensive list of solutions, but just to sort of throw out a few things. Uh, in today's system, there are few incentives for quality. There's just, there is incentives for shortcuts, there's incentive for profit, but there are few incentives for quality. And a global supply, while it has, uh, you know, been miraculous in enabling PEPFAR and the Global Fund and those achievements, which are very real, have made drug plants harder to police, and that is just a fact. Uh, and that the current system of pre-announced inspections and data review is inadequate for detecting fraud. Um, so, you know, just to put on the table a few ideas, establish a global cadre of highly trained investigators able to detect data fraud. There is a wide range in the quality of investigators and inspectors, not just in the quality of drugs. Um, unannounced inspections should be the world's norm. Um, establishing uh, procurement guidelines that really prioritize and incentivize quality. You folks are the experts on that. I wouldn't have a clue how to do that, but it is a thought. Um, and systematic surveillance testing of drugs, which seems absolutely essential to any adequate regulatory system. So thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to speak today about this issue. and. Uh, over to you folks. Great. Thank, you. Thank you. I'd like to invite our panelists to come up to the stage, um, as well as my colleague, Sean Bartlett. He's CGD's Director of Communications and will be moderating our panel today. Good morning, everybody, and thanks again for being here today. As Janine said, I'm Sean Bartlett, the Director of Communications here, and I want to thank Catherine and Amanda both for those uh, presentations and bring our two other panelists into this uh, conversation and open it up. Um, Dr. Jen Cates is the Senior Vice President uh, and Director of Global Health and HIV Policy at the Kaiser Family Foundation, and Dr. Prashant Yadav is our new visiting fellow here at CGD on our global health team and also a professor at INSEAD. Um, I want to invite you both to react to what we heard from both Amanda and Catherine generally, but also I think pose a specific question to each of you as we do that. Jen, you heard Amanda talk about you know, the need for quality assured generics as we move toward 
universal health coverage, but also just greater global public health in the world. And some of Catherine's findings, as we just saw in Bottle of Lies, would seem to indicate we're pretty far, I think, from that aspiration. So it's kind of a broad question, but what is the middle point there? You know, as more countries are starting to move toward their own procurement, their own inspections, how do we help them build capacity and do more regulatory quality control issues, especially as they're transitioning away from typical donor aid? Great. Um, thanks for the question and the opportunity sure. to be here. Thanks to CGD. Um, two upfront things I want to say. Read the book. It's very gripping. <laughs> um, it's, it's, a it's not a short book, but you will read it quickly because you want it, it really draws you in to the stories and lives of, of these individuals who risked a lot to, to speak with Catherine and, and tell their story. Um, also to CGD for the report, um, which is designed to look ahead and, and try to uh, anticipate the future we know is coming and the challenges that will be there. Um, and in fact, it's critical because we haven't figured out the challenges of today. There's a huge gap between those who need medications and those who are getting them, putting aside even the quality issues. So looking ahead, knowing that there's some real other things coming along that could disrupt the system that we already have in ways that are both um, predictable and unintended, it, it's a real risk there. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a, a different view, though, um, and maybe it's less of, it is a middle ground, but it's also maybe more optimistic in a sense of a glass half full. And most of my experience is looking at the ARV, the antiretroviral drug market, um, and we did hear some pretty disturbing uh, potential issues or issues that occurred with Ranbaxy for sure. Um, and uh, other things. And one, of the, one thing to note is most of those points in time were a while ago. Um, and I, I would posit that a lot of that has been addressed for antiretrovirals. So um, one thing to, that, I, that I think about taking a step back is that it's really been just less than two decades, less than, than 20 years, since a glo new global procurement system, at least from the prosperities and some other infectious disease medications, has been made available. And I don't think we've fully yet taken stock of it from a, from a perspective of what have we learned and what has it done well and where can that be replicated. And by those systems, I mean the WHO pre-qualification system, which didn't, wasn't created until 2001 and was created in large part because of HIV and NTB, um, followed quickly by the Global Fund being created, PEPFAR being created, um, and the, ex, the FDA expedited approval. Those are not perfect systems, of course, but they are a sea change to what existed before them. And, and Gavi, I should say, even though I know the, the, the CDD report wasn't looking at vaccines per se, but really these, these um, institutions that did not exist less than 20 years ago have, in a positive sense, revolutionized the potential for what can be done and in some cases actually what's being done. And then even step, taking one step further back, and thinking about the origins of the generic, the modern generic drug industry that you detail in your book, it really probably dates back to what Hacks Waxman, uh, uh, Waxman Hatch Bill, 1984, um, when the, the six month incentive was put in place and a, a number of other things that jump started that market uh, in the United States and then around the world. What did that coincide with? It was right after the onset of the HIV epidemic. And those two things, I believe, collided in a way that um, have changed, changed for good and bad the sort of evolution and revolution of the generic drug marketplace. Um, because of ARV, because of the AIDS crisis, and eventually the recognition, not until probably around 2000, 2001, 2002, that, and it wasn't universal, that there should be a global movement to uh, provide access to antiretrovirals in low and middle income countries. Um, prior to that, that consensus, consensus did not exist, as many of have, who've heard me speak say, because I think it's really important to re recall that period. Um, and it was the recognition by the Global Fund, by PEPFAR, that that could not be done without generics. So that posed a problem, how, how to do that. And um, those systems that now we now have were in their infancy. In 2005, when that um, PowerPoint, the famous PowerPoint that you detail in your book, I think it was around then when that, that was circulated, that was the infancy, in a sense, of the Global Fund's uh, quality procurement system being developed, and PEPFAR's FDA expedited approval process was just starting. 
So these things did exist, and there were not good ways to catch them. Um, however, now, many, you know, less than 20 years later, but uh, uh, at this point, we know from the data, at least in the, in the antiretroviral mar uh, marketplace, we know from the data, and by that I mean the impact on life, ex the impact on, on mortality um, going, mortality rates going down significantly and life expectancy going up, incidence rates going down, viral suppression rates going up, those are probably our best quality markers that we have. And while there are, I'm sure, examples that still exist, the, the systems that have been put in place for those, that marketplace, is quite a model. Um, and I, I do know that at least in the Global Fund uh, procurement guidelines and for, the, for PEPFAR and through USAID, they do post, -mark, they do testing, they do random testing of, of the medications that are out there. They ha doesn't mean they catch everything that might be going on, but the kind of the ideal systems that you are talking about are, are mo they're moving in those directions and I, I would hope that we'd want to emulate them as opposed to um, break them down and, and bolster them up. Um, the other thing that you, you raised was this issue of uh, what do we do going forward? And I think there's the biggest risk there, which is detailed in the CDB report, is the loss of external aid. And that's a big issue in, in the ARV market. I was just looking at a few countries before um, coming today, and uh, for PEPFAR procurement, or for PEPFAR countries, for ARVs, in Tanzania and Mozambique for the most recent year, um, their data, 100% of the ARV procurement is um, external, 100%. Um, for Zambia, uh, it's 94%, and for Kenya, it's 92%. That is both an opportunity and a huge challenge. What does that mean in 10 years or 15 years if PEPFAR and the Global Fund are going eventually going to be scaling down their support um, to, first of all, um, the funding replacement is not at all obvious here, but also the systems replacement. I think that the, both the Global Fund and PEPFAR have been moving, you know, thinking ahead, especially the Global Fund. Um, we could talk about whether what PEPFAR is putting in place or USAID is putting in place, but the Global Fund has really taken a hard look at this, and it's not an easy um, answer but is trying to move in that direction and figure out ways to promote quality incentives in co all countries that are, clearly that it's funding, but countries that it's transitioning off of aid. Um, it's, it's a complicated one. It's hard to, you can't be, a first of all, the Global Fund's not a regulator. And second of all, it can't be a regulator at all in countries where it's not providing um, any, any support. So what could be done to incentivize this kind of uh, marketplace? I would say the, the other thing that is important to note from these, these systems that we want to carry forward is that they um, have uh, uh, leveraged each other. So when the FDA um, expedited review for PEPFAR was first created, uh, it was explicitly created as its own mechanism outside of the WHO prequalification process. Um, and there are reasons for that. We can argue whether that was good or bad, but today we have a system where in, in some cases, or in many cases, at least for ARVs, the WHO process and the PEPFAR process kind of leverage each other to promote um, the medications that receive those, those, those approvals, which is important, right? That's what you want. Um, and to a lesser extent, that's happening. Well, it won't happen with malaria and TB because FDA doesn't have the same kind of system for those medications. Um, but it does, the Global Fund and, and um, WHO pre-qualification play that role there. So I think that's really important. The other thing that the report points out, um, though, that I think is a big risk for the future, it's putting aside ARVs, all the other drugs out there. Um, all the other global health procurement uh, the co commodities that are procured either currently or under procured that are just, the, these systems do not exist for them um, at all. And I think USAID, is, as a big procurer, has many of, of the, the quality assurance mechanisms that it tries to put in place. But just looking at um, oxytocin, lipitocin, um, recent data that was just posted by USAID showing uh, sort of an overview of quality of that medication um, is it's really poor. Um, not the USAID procured medications, but what's actually happening in markets. I'd say in most of those cases, it's not so much um, that the quality is bad for patients, it's that it's not as effective. <coughs> you don't want that to be the case when you're talking about postpartum situations. So, I mean, there's a lot of challenges out there. I would just leave with one thing that, that I think there's a, the systems that have been put in place in the last 20 years are incredible. We could not have anticipated them. I think if the AIDS epidemic had not collided with the, the burst of the generic drug market, um, as we know it today, we might not have those systems. So 
we should look to them, build on them, and improve them. Thanks, Jen, very much. Um, Prashant, Jen talked about those quality markers that have been in place for a while, and I think picking up on that issue of quality and procurement, how do quality of medicines in the system depend on the supply chain model that's used? In one of the reviews of Catherine's book, I saw an anecdote that said that as many as 80 players could be involved sometimes in the move from like the raw material to the store shelf. So how is the quality issue in the supply chain? You can suss that out a little bit. Yeah, th <clears throat> thanks. So I think first I want to I want to acknowledge that I have tremendous respect for the work that Dinesh has done and uh, a whistleblower for the Puerto Rico 2010 issue and the work that Catherine has done. Th these have helped us understand uh, both the extent of the problem and what are things we might be missing in, in otherwise uh, an assumption we make that you know our, our regulatory apparatus is working well. That said, I think we've got to differentiate between three different types of quality which is getting confounded in our discussion. The first is uh, what we are calling quality in the sense of what goes into marketing authorization of a product. And this is what Catherine highlights in the work with you know, data integrity issues from Renbaxi and so on. The second is quality in the manufacturing process once marketing authorization, and let's assume for a moment marketing authorization was done based on uh, data which had integrity, um, routine manufacturing. And the third is quality within the supply system, storage, and you, know, you highlight that, Amanda. So what happens is um, most times we assume that um, a manufacturer would sell higher quality to the public sector, and I think most times the global work outside of the global procurement systems has thought, oh, if, if some patients go to a private pharmacy in a, in a rural setting in a country, that's where they'll find low quality medicines. And if they go to a government clinic, hopefully the medicine quality is high. So one statistic I want to point is um, India did the National Drug Quality Survey, which is a large sample national study, and it shows that in the private pharmacies in India, the percentage of um, non-standard products is about 3%. In the public sector, it is about 11%. So if you go to a government clinic, the chances of finding substandard or poor quality product is much higher. So as you dig deeper, why does that happen? Well, the reason that happens is the government uh, purchases, and these are decentralized purchasing entities, so not the national government, but state governments, um, are purchasing on a least lowest price clause. So if a manufacturer thinks about quality, they, I mean, I think Ginger Yin at um, Maryland has done some work which shows that they think of it as three quality segments. The highest quality segment is industrialized countries with a good regulatory apparatus. Uh, the second is global fund, PEPFAR, global agencies, and third is the rest of the world. And so, so they, would, they would sell this really low quality when the only thing that matters is price. So the larger problem we are facing, in my opinion, isn't of the type which is product coming to the United States or what the global fund is buying, is the product that decentralized procurement entities in countries are purchasing because they are purchasing on the lowest price class. And that's a complex trade-off we have to solve for in a way because their incentives currently are, I want to procure for UHC, I want to use my very limited budget to go farther in terms of coverage, uh, and therefore I should buy what I can buy at the lowest cost, given that it has been approved by the local regulator. So there has to be a, a strong global focus on building local regulation, in the absence of which the kind of supply chain model, procurement supply chain model we can use becomes very constrained. We can't use what we would call as the optimal supply chain model. One additional thing I want to highlight is that the fact that um, drug regulation isn't necessarily a national subject in most federal countries. Because what happens is the, the approval or the marketing authorization uh, is handled by the national regulatory agency. But in many countries, the manufacturing plant and inspections after marketing authorization are a state subject. And as you'd imagine, very complex industrial policy and political economy now sets in because a state elected representative wants to protect a manufacturing plant in their state, in their province. Uh, so it requires rethinking in a way about how in a federalist structure do you think about aspects of quality regulation? And I think China's done a, a, a good job in, in rethinking that structure a little bit. So that 
hasn't entered discussion in, in the global architecture of quality and procurement yet. Okay. Thanks for that. Amanda, do you want to jump in there? In your talk just now, you talked about maybe some future work focusing on safe medicines in the supply chain. And in, our, in the triple transition report that you and our colleagues authored, you talked about, in the generic medicine sections, the issue of both quality and competition. I feel like quality is our buzzword today, but I wonder if we can go into the competition piece to a little bit, um, specifically how the lack of competition might be stifling these markets. Yeah. So, I mean, if you think about one of the most highly publicized cases uh, in the United States, uh, Martin Shkreli, the famous pharma bro, <laughs> that was generic. It was a generic product, mm -hmm. um, but the, he was the only supplier. So he was a price setter. And so that's, that's why we're talking about, you know, in the procurement tenders that are being issued by the public sector or large insurers, we need to be sure we're also testing quality and all the rest, but we are also we also need to make sure that there are a number of suppliers that are incentivized to provide to us. Now, I, I mean, I think, you know, I, I need to look at this further. I think we need to study it further, but we had been working with some colleagues at the Toulouse School of Economics to see, you know, when we regulate the supply of electricity, for example, we build in redundant electricity supply and we have certain specifications about what level of supply and the quality of the supply, the continuity of the supply. That's part of those procurement tenders. And the question is, could we bring some of the insights from industrial organization economics and other sectors to the way that we buy medicines as well? I think the best procurers in the United States are already doing this. Mm -hmm. But some are not, and some key products have been ignored. So we should be creating incentives for multiple suppliers to be in the system. And we see that as, uh, is an imperative also in the low middle income countries as well. Mm -hmm. If we're only buying lease costs from a single supplier for 90, 100% uh, in a, any given product class, that's not going to get us either the best price nor the best quality. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's about how we structure the tenders. And I think, you know, what, of course, it's always the case that more research is needed, particularly <laughs> if you're sitting at a think tank. But I do think that the documentation on this is still quite weak. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's hard to get access to these tenders to be able to understand what they look like now and what kinds of incentives they're providing, how much competition there is in the, in the response to the tenders. We'd love to look at that even in the context of uh, PEPFAR or other global health funds. Um, but I think you know, this idea of competition, also keeping in mind quality and supply security is something we need to look at very carefully, both in the US and overseas. Thanks. And just yeah. another one mm -hmm. thing to say, I think the other thing that struck me, and this is ill-formed is, you know, how important this industry is for China and India and how important it is that they think about improving the quality of the products that are being supplied to all segments. Yep. Um, I think as our ability to test gets better, as new technologies are developed, um, we're going to know about problems in the drug supply chain sooner. And I guess I would invite also Prashant mm -hmm. to maybe reflect on that as well. And so. When we think about what could the global health community do, what could the World Bank do to make sure that the regulation of these industries and that the supply chains um, and, and the procurement structures that are around it are really all creating virtuous incentives to improve safe medicine supply. So I think that's an area that we'd like to dive into mm -hmm. further going forward. Prashant, please. So I think on the, on the point of competition, I think one thing I want to highlight is oftentimes we think of competition only at the finished product manufacturing mm -hmm. level and we, yeah. we assume yeah. wrongfully that we have competition. And we have numerous instances where there are you know, 30 or 40 finished product manufacturers, but there is a single active ingredient manufacturer. And mm -hmm. so we need to look at competition at multiple tiers mm -hmm. in the system and then truly understand and there are economies of scale in mm -hmm. manufacturing, so we are not talking about competition in the sense of over-fragmenting the market, but finding right. Uh, the right balance. Between. On that point, I know none of us are necessarily national security experts or trade and tariff experts, but that op-ed from Congresswoman Eshoo mm -hmm. and Congressman Schiff about APIs coming from China especially. You know, Catherine, your book, certainly for a layperson who, like almost all of us, take generic medicines and think about these from time to time, you don't necessarily think about API or where some of these things are deriving yeah. from. And so I, this is a broad question for anybody, but in the ongoing issues between the United States and China, this has not risen to the headlines yet, and you haven't heard it really at the negotiating table. 
I wonder if that's because American and Chinese officials know just how serious this is, or is that something that's coming down the pike if we don't, if this continues to go south just in terms of more commercial trade? I know it's kind of a no loaded question. On API. <laughs> well, the, yeah, that's what, yeah, that's it. I mean, the, you know, the, the Pentagon recently testified at a, um, uh, at a uh, hearing in Washington, D.C. that they, they view our dependence on China as a serious national security issue, uh, you know, which it absolutely is. And then you consider the fact that, you know, 80% of the active ingredient in all our drugs, whether it's brand or generic, are coming from overseas. Um, you know, and and uh, not to go nativist, but it's really like, uh, you know, you begin thinking about how do you begin to rebuild a manufacturing sector in the U.S. that we have lost? Um, and there are, I think, some interesting um, models that are really fledgling, but they're nonprofit drug manufacturing. Mm -hmm. um, what a concept! Um, uh, so, you know, those are just some, some thoughts yeah. that come to mind. And do we, Amanda, I guess, do we rebuild necessarily or do we talk about ensuring better quality and is it something about can international organizations or other groups help with So, this? I mean, we're yeah. sitting at the Center for Global Development and <laughs> yes. we, don't, we don't have a global government, That's right? right? And we're not going to have a global government <laughs> soon. So, um, you know, I, I think, for, you know, when, from the perspective of global development, these industries have been huge job creators. They are important contributors to the economy in India and China. Um, I think there, there is some thinking that if all of us do better, we're all better off afterwards. We know that a global supply chain has helped us realize lower prices. So, I, I mean, I'd like to see us fix what's broken and make the international system mm -hmm. work better before we decide to self-manufacture here. And sure. I mean, we have to look at the econ economics of that. There's certainly been, um, you know, maybe the case of Brazil, the Instituto Butantan that generates, it. it uh, it's a state-owned enterprise that um, manufactures vaccine, for example. But mm -hmm. I would say they were manufacturing yellow fever vaccine, and then there was a huge spike in yellow fever elsewhere in the world and they were not able to meet supply and they weren't necessarily paying attention to global market incentives to mm -hmm. provide. So I think we really do need to think of this as a global issue. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, we, we should obviously ensure supply security, whatever that means. And I think that means multiple manufacturers. Right. There's, mm -hmm. there's space for all of us in 1.5 trillion, right? <laughs> That's right, yeah. So I, mean, I think um, a case I would make is that as compared to overall supply, our knowledge of the API market capacity, what happens upstream, is actually higher for the three HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria. So if you look at the global funds procurement systems, I think they have people dedicated to thinking about the API market. Same thing with PEFFAR. And the reason is not just quality. It was about supply, mm -hmm. uh, supply sufficiency. Right? So we wanted to understand, is there enough API supply for malaria drugs for ARVs of the mm -hmm. new types and so on. So as a result, it got us to thinking more about the upstream market. So I think we feel a little bit more confident about our understanding upstream for um, HTB and malaria than we would for all other diseases. The second is if you go back and ask what led to API manufacturing shifting out of North America and Europe to China, mm -hmm. it's a very capital intensive operation. So it's not mm -hmm. about labor cost. Um, because the plants are capital intensive and actually in a state-of-the-art API manufacturing probably doesn't even employ as many people. It was mostly capital intensity needed, cost of capital, and environmental legislation which led mm -hmm. to API manufacturing shifting to China. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, that's the underlying driver and we'll have to rethink very mm -hmm. carefully if we say API manufacturing is to come back to Europe mm -hmm. or North America. It'll be of a, a massive rethink of mm -hmm. um, you know various aspects of environmental mm -hmm. regulation and so mm -hmm. because these are I mean accepted it's a it's a very dirty mm -hmm. manufacturing process mm -hmm. in many instances. Mm -hmm. Jen, with your experience mm -hmm. in ARV, mm -hmm. these these issues that we're talking about at a broader level, how do they translate to antiretrovirals and HIV policy? Well, and I think that's the good example we have. And and speaking, you know, picking up what Amanda was saying, I think it's what in a sense, market shaping um, tools do we have that can benefit the whole market? 
Um, I mean, in the, in the ARV case, it was new funding, mm -hmm. but also a global uh, consensus. Um, and so it, it, I think it is putting aside where the manufacturer is located. I think it's really what are the combination of regulatory and other policy tools and other market-based incentives that can be created to stimulate um, what we're all trying to drive toward. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's hard to do, I mean, yeah. I think it, but it has been done. And it's, again, what, what I, I think we need to take the 20 so years that we are learning from um, and the, the floods and valleys along the way and apply them forward to better understand how these tools can be put in place to other areas, to continue them for ARVs, for TB drugs, for malaria drugs, but also for other areas, diagnostics, for um, commodities and maternal and child health, where they, this is not, it's, hasn't been tried it or as successful. Um, so I think what I would say is for the ARV case, it's learning from that experience and where how that has worked and what really drove it and what can drive it in the future. Um, also, the other thing about the ARV market that's very interesting is I also work on our uh, domestic HIV, so issues of HIV in the United States, and that community is clamoring for generics. Mm -hmm. There are no generic uh, combination mm -hmm. therapies yet that are the sort of recommended um, regimens yet available in the U.S. for treatment, and generic PrEP is coming, but it's not here yet, and so there's this a, a big push to get that movie, to have generics for, AR, for antiretrovirals here in the United States, um, one of the few places where they're not available, um, maybe the only. And um, uh, there's an assumption that, just like this, sometimes an assumption that you know generics equal lower quality, which is true in some cases, but not necessarily in all cases, there's an assumption that generics equal lower price, and that is also not the case. So um, we have not solved this for ARVs, is not the point I'm trying to make, but mm -hmm. I think we've, we've, there's been significant work done in that market that we can learn from outside the U.S., mm -hmm. not inside the U.S. Um, Thanks for that. Catherine, I want to go back to the book, and um, I read in STAT just last week that the FDA has increased its inspections in generic manufacturing facilities overseas over the last five-year period by 20 percent. But what leapt out to me in your book was the whole invitation inspections thing, and even more alarming when that turns into almost invitation investigating tourism in a way with the golf outings and the hotels. I was surprised by the anecdote that said, well, sometimes we need help with visas and hotels. I guess what immediately came to my mind was, where's the U.S. Embassy in all this? Like, the FDA is a U.S. government agency. Mm -hmm. The embassy helps facilitate government and U.S. corporate issues all the time. So I just, I wonder if you might share a little bit about what they said to you on the record, on background about that, and how they might try to address this going forward. Um, so first of all, there is a way to do unannounced inspections because it's been done. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a pilot program in India uh, that the FDA did for about a year and a half from, um, I think it was mid-2013 to 2015, where they said, okay, no more invitation letters, no more regulatory tourism, this is going to be, we're going to just turn out the lights here, we're gonna do unannounced or very short notice inspections, we're gonna route all the travel through the U.S. Embassy, mm. right? Um, you know, we'll give the Indian regulators a sort of short heads up, um, and they even, uh, and even with short notice inspections, sometimes that they, they then changed up uh, arrival days. Mm -hmm. So it really was this is this is a you know uh, this is surprise inspections. That's the closest model to uh, what we have in the U.S. And what they found is that the rate of serious findings, are called official action indicated, which is sort of the you know the the biggest uh, regulatory sanction uh, in an inspection that the U.S. has increased by almost 60%. Mm. So there is no question that uh, unannounced inspections work. They can be done. Um, and after that very successful experiment, the FDA said, okay, well, that's it. And now we're going back to pre-announced inspections. 
Um, you know, one question, to be honest, in the course of my reporting is the question of whether the FDA really wants to know mm. what is going on inside these plants, because there is a, <laughs> there is a cost to knowing as well. You know, if you have a, a, an OAI inspection, and then you've got warning letter, and then you've got other possible ramifications, then you have supply interruptions, because maybe you have to impose an import alert, and we've got mm -hmm. drug shortages. And then you have worse numbers to Congress about how many drugs we have. So, you know, there is a sort of wide range of consequences to really knowing what's going on. But I mean, one thing I would just like to say <laughs> from my reporting and the response to it, patients want to know. Mm. Maybe the FDA doesn't want to know. Every single patient wants to know. Uh, Jen and then Prashant. Yeah, I was gonna add, one of the things that really comes out in, in, your, in your book, and maybe the subtitle could have been, you know, uh, reverse incentives, is that there's all these incentives <laughs> that, that are at cross purposes. And so one of them, which is not necessarily coming from FDA's place of not wanting to know if there's problems, mm -hmm. but it's needing to have approvals and needing to right. show a metric right. of mm -hmm. we are moving forward in right. this realm. So that is a, you know, comes at, at uh, poses this other, uh, other direction. The other that you talk about a little bit, but in my, it intrigued my uh, interest and it gets at the embassy question is diplomacy. So part of the reason um, the, the uh, unannounced inspections aren't, weren't happening was um, the issues of diplomacy. You know, this is gonna ruin our, mm. we have diplomatic mm. relations, right. we have to take that into consideration. And I would say right. that that problem exists at even more so now. So that I don't know how to solve for that, mm -hmm. but that is a real issue, right? And, and you, I mean, whether it's tariffs or something else, right. it, you know, these, these, we can't isolate this market right. from the larger picture. Right. So I think unannounced inspections are extremely hard. So I'm, I'm not taking, I'm not defending the position of the FDA on this, but I think that the real challenge is that um, there has to be some local law enforcement mm -hmm. in the place mm -hmm. where a facility is located. And like I described earlier, because of federal structures in many of the countries, even if the diplomacy with the national government works, that doesn't guarantee you that the state or the district level local law enforcement will ensure the safety and um, and comfort and, and other things that are important for an inspector. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the right way to, to solve for this problem is we cannot shy away from international cooperation on quality regulation, mm -hmm. and we cannot shy away from investing more of um, global dollars in bringing up the quality regulatory capacity of countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, people will say that hasn't worked well. Industrial policy has taken it on a different you know, side in the past. But that has to be the cornerstone of mm -hmm. efforts to improve quality because FDA getting more resourcing and sending more inspectors has so many other issues which are centered around industrial mm -hmm. policy, safety and security, diplomacy, and then trying to solve each piece mm -hmm. one by one will still take, it'll test the patience mm -hmm. of the American patient. Did you want to respond? Oh, no, I was just going to say, I mean, there is this one example in the book where um, through a whistleblower, the F, not Dinesh Thakur, but another one, the FDA had information about um, a sterile drug plant that was quite possibly falsifying um, its microbial testing data, which is very, very bad. So, uh, and there was a request uh, made by some officials up the chain, uh, we want to do an unannounced in inspection and we've been told uh, they've moved the, the records that show this falsification to a warehouse that's some distance from the plant. We want to do an unannounced inspection of the warehouse. And the answer came back, we can't do an unannounced inspection of the warehouse because we're working on this four-page statement of intent of mutual cooperation uh, with, Indian, with the Indian government and if we piss them off now, that'll all fall apart. So, I mean, it was just so clear the kind of uh, diplomatic concerns that uh, interfere with the public health mission. You know, on the other hand, you know, we have a, such a, a benefit to public health mm -hmm. from this global drug supply. So it is obviously a very complicated mm -hmm. picture. Thanks for sharing that. I think now is a good time to turn it over um, to our audience for some questions. We've got about 20 minutes left, so 
Um, please state your name and affiliation, and we'll take a couple questions uh, at a time. We also invite people watching. We had hundreds of people RSVP on our webcast and through Twitter. Your book caused a lot of <laughs> interest around the world as well, for sure. Um, so please, with that, we'll take a few questions. Please, right here. Um, Julie is going to bring a microphone over to you for the audio. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm Maureen Lewis from Assessive Global, and I want to say this was a great panel. And I have a couple of questions, but first I want to ask uh, Catherine, do you have a bodyguard? <sighs> um, I think I may need one for my upcoming book tour in India. Um, uh, I don't. I no, don't. but I, I mean, my point is that this yeah. is, these are highly, highly sensitive issues. But um, I think you've raised, I mean, the, the panel has raised a lot of issues and your book clearly right. comes out with some really big issues. So I've got a couple of questions. One is, what percent of generic drugs that are produced are actually owned by, the brand, by brand name drug companies? Because it's pretty high, which means that you, can, you should also be able to deal with them. But the second question is also related to something that you said. Because I'm sort of thinking that one of the big problems for developing countries, it's not just, I mean, they can now get ARVs and for, for three diseases they can do pretty well. But those diseases are a, a declining proportion of what they're purchasing. And they have virtually no way to make sure that those are you know, viable drugs. They're too, their country's either too small, too poor, or both. Um, and so, is there ever been any sort of thought about having the OECD come together with systematic testing or doing something of that kind? Because there's, there's an interest in affecting those countries, but it would have spillover effects to developing countries as well, which I think could be really quite beneficial because as Prashant has said, you know, there, there are different parts of the supply chain. But if you can get that right, that may help the private sector market as well as actually the incoming for the public sector. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Please, over here. <coughs> and then, Anit. <clears throat> Javier Guzman, uh, Management Sciences for Health. Um, thank you very much for the panel and the interesting discussion. A couple of comments before the question. Um, I think phrasing the debate between generics and originator medicines is wrong, is, it, it, and it affects uh, basically the work regulators do. Uh, regulators are basically uh, working on legitimacy and trust, so it costs a lot to repair uh, damages to legit legitimacy and trust. And if we talk about quality, I mean, we should also talk about GSK and Sanofi because there are a lot of examples out there about innovator products failing quality standards as well. So that's, that's I think, uh, an interesting point to consider. Now, in terms of um, low and middle income countries, um, I don't think, I think the problem, and I, I, I agree with what, what was just said, uh, we have three, medis three diseases with good supply, good, good structures, a successful story in the past 20 years, but that's not sustainable, and that actually affected countries uh, and regulators on the ground. So that's not something to replicate or to scale up or to think that pre the pre-qualification program can actually do the work of the 185 regulatory agencies. The only solution is a local or regional solution. That's the only way to go. And to build local and regional solutions, funders, development partners need to be there for a long time. Systems are not built mm -hmm. overnight. So this desire to measure progress in terms of number of products delivered, or number of patients on ARVs, or number of kids and their sleeping under bed nets, is basically the wrong, or it's, it's, it's not the wrong, it's basically very appealing. It's a very appealing indicator. But how do we encourage uh, donors to invest into systems and how we measure uh, success in building systems? Um, and I think USAID is trying. I mean, I'm, I'm part of a global program trying to do so. Uh, but it takes time. And an interesting highlight, and looking at the, the, the positive angle, is WHO is now playing a very important role in determining uh, the standards, so mm -hmm. the global benchmarking tool. Mm -hmm. And the global benchmarking tool is the first time that globally there's an accepted way of measuring capacity. Now, the solution is not global, it's local. Because the important thing is that the regulator, after measuring uh, the, the, the capabilities develop an institutional development plan. 
So no funder, no donor should come and do anything unless there is an institution, un unless it's part of the institutional development plan. So I guess is the common is bringing back um, these decisions to the local uh, regulators. Otherwise, it will, not, it will not be done. In terms of the answer to um, how to do it, so is reliance the key thing? Reliance is something that hasn't been done. So regulators, I don't think, should build uh, capacity thinking that the only, they, uh, they are the only regulators on Earth. So they should base and leverage decisions from other regulatory authorities. Mm. So in terms of the inspections, FDA, they conduct their own inspections. EMA, they conduct their own inspections. TGA, they conduct their own inspections. They don't share inspections reports. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the report by the National, National Academy of Sciences, that was the first recommendation, but that hasn't happened at the high income country level. So how could you actually say to low and middle income countries, go down that path? Um, but I think countries in, in, in low and middle income countries are trying to do regional approaches, look at the uh, wrecks in Africa, look at the Pacific Alliance in Latin America, look at the CARICOM in the Caribbean. So the solution is a regional solution with local sustainability. Mm -hmm. So the question now, sorry about the long talk, um, the question now is why do we talk only, only about procurement? Why do we talk about regulation for the sake of regulation or regulation for the sake of quality? Because if we talk about procurement, the outcome is basically, or the indicators are basically products, number of products delivered. And that might actually steer the conversation in only a particular direction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anit, and then we'll invite the panel to address some of these questions. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for all your stellar work. I think in, a, in some way, your work actually did good to the Indian pharmaceutical industry, the generics. But the point still remains is that we haven't addressed the big elephant in the room, which is corruption. Right. And why is it that the FDA allowed this to happen at the time that they did? Um, it's, it's an open secret. And we who worked in the Indian government, we know how these inspection systems work. Mm -hmm. And we thought that if in FDA would come in and actually have more stringent standards, and it would shake out some of these, uh, these companies and the practices. Now, I'm wondering, that is one question, that whether you investigated the corruption on the FDA side. And second, what did it do to the big pharma? Because they didn't change their $20,000 per course of one year generics, whereas one year, you know, ARV drugs, whereas the Indian pharmaceutical companies or Chinese would later on would be giving them at 400. So there is this huge disparity in the prices, which is the incentive. And for a developing country policymaker, that's everything, mm -hmm. right? So just those two questions and whether you Thanks have any thoughts. So Catherine, let's start there and then we can go, we'll go in reverse order and then we'll take some more questions in the next round. Okay. Um, uh, so the corruption point, um, I did investigate corruption, absolutely. You know, um, and uh, first let me just talk about FDA. Um, you know, embedded in those 20,000 pages of internal documents, okay? I mean, the problem of regulatory tourism, which is the phrase that one of my sources used, really jumps out. And the fact that the FDA over the years has been put on notice that they have a problem with their own inspectorate in India, right? I mean, and, and China too, but but uh, I would say that a lot of the um, documents I received related to India, so let's just look there for a second. Um, you know, they, they had whistleblowers all throughout Indian companies who were trying to do the right thing and are writing into them and saying, hey, you know, your inspectors are being offered incentives. Um, they're being offered gold coins. They're being wined and dined. I mean, there were, there were allegations. I couldn't print them even because I couldn't absolutely 100% corroborate them. But there are allegations that go even beyond that. Um, so you know, there is no question that there is a, uh, a, a, pr a problematic sort of broken model here that needs to be rethought. You know, and the fact that. Um, their own inspectorate is being sent into distant co 
countries, India and China, let's say, you know, with very little training, with very little specialized ethics training, and there are cultural issues too. I mean, what do you do when you show up and they want to give you a welcome dinner? You know, what do you do when they refuse to let you pay for your meal? I mean, these are all kinds of questions and they really do have a very corrosive effect on the quality of the inspection. There is no doubt about that. And I feel that the FDA really has not addressed those issues, so. Thanks, Catherine. Amanda, did you want to take that procurement versus regulation question and that maybe over-focus? Well, I mean, I think both are important. I think we felt that the procurement angle had not been addressed much. And there have been a number of very large scale initiatives at the global level to look into the quality of regulation. Um, but we felt the connection between the regulation and the procurement was less examined. So that's, that was sort of the motivation for, for writing the report and convening the working group. But, you know, I think it's both. It's it's not either or. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, it, and it seems clear, too, that uh, the regulatory apparatus intersects so deeply with the procurement apparatus and sort of what, what is it that the procurement requires that the market authorization does not require. Um, you know, in, in some countries, they're pulling more up towards the regulator. Your, your, uh, Javier was uh, the FDA commissioner equivalent for Colombia. Mm. So he really knows these issues very, very well. Um, prior to his uh, current position. Um, but just to say, you know, it's, it, you know, you, there's more the regulator could do, but in many countries they don't do it. So mm -hmm. I think we have to work on both angles. And I think the other thing that stands out to me is that when I look at organizations like the World Bank or the Regional Development Bank, there has been so little done to look at this sector in a rigorous way, um, to talk with their counterparts on the other side of the table about regulatory or legal reforms that might be required how it intersects with the desire of governments to deliver better quality health care to more of its citizens. So I think it's just a space that's, um, it's been, because it is so technical, and it is, you know, I'm, we're not going to sit here. We need to bring the FDA here to talk about, you know, what is gold standard and in inspection quality, among others, uh, what bioequivalents, all those kinds of things. We're not, we're not the experts in that. But um, I do think that there's so much more that we could do. It's not, it shouldn't just be for technical experts because these are seriously large uh, economic issues. They're global development issues. And I, th I think that's my kind of take on the issue. I like the idea of the regional stuff and mm -hmm. learning from what has worked as well at the regional level in terms of regulatory harmonization and inspection mm -hmm. improvements, exchange of information. That all sounds extraordinarily yeah. important. Prashant, and then Jen, if you want to go in. Yeah, so I think going back to Javier's comment, I think one thing we haven't done well, and I think if you look at who has invested in the in the global architecture, who has invested in quality, it's predominantly Global Fund, USAID, PEPFAR, right? And so the question arises, you know, what is what are multilateral or regional development banks doing around this? And if you go back and ask, is there a clear investment case mm -hmm. where you can show a reasonable return on investment? from improving quality through a series of you know, 10 year long investments. That doesn't exist. Uh, and if we try to build that, that will show us the interface between pure play regulatory strengthening and doing that in conjunction with procurement. Yeah. And I think that probably is an area which has not been addressed as well. And I think the World Bank has been a little bit missing from this discussion around quality mm -hmm. improvement, quality regulation, mm -hmm. you know, how to invest in that. Yeah. I would just add two things that have really been said, but just to pick up on two points you made. Um, totally agree if the outcome or the measure that is the metrics being used is number of bed nets and number of ARVs uh, supplied, which were the earlier measures that we all looked at, you're not going to get the necessarily get the outcomes you want and really has to be the health outcome. So I think moving in that direction and making that the ultimate metric is, is critical. And I completely agree on the regional solutions. I, I think the local solution is the ultimate, but that's going to... That's a much harder uh, path, takes a lot longer and a lot of investment. So what is, the, what is the way to sort of capitalize on the global interventions that have been done that are good, not replicate that necessarily where, as you say, it, 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 takes the, it doesn't build up the local market um, or the local regulator. So how do we sort of, what, where do we meet in the middle and is a regional solution one? And I would say maybe there are global solutions where it's not just, is the answer to have a local replicated, um, exactly perfect uh, system the 
right way to go at this point in time. I don't know. We had also had the question about a possible OECD mechanism, and then your specific question about the percentage of generics produced um, that are actually owned by brand name companies. Does anyone know that well, ballpark? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't have an exact number, but I just want to say that um, I think you're right that it is hard to just talk about the generic industry mm -hmm. because there is so much cross fertilization. I mean, you know, first of mm -hmm. all, the generic and brand name companies are using some of the same factories mm -hmm. to make APIs. To, but to purchase their APIs, uh, you know, the brand companies are getting into the authorized generics business through subsidiaries. You know, you have generics companies that are making branded generics. And so I think that in a way the, the distinctions are uh, sort of collapsing around us, really. Mm -hmm. We can take another round of questions. Yes, please, here in the front and then in the back as well. Hey, Jose Noguera, Sanofi. Great panel, thank you very much, because it is the first time I see a holistic view of the issue. Very often it has been centered on price, demonizing the big pharma, and I have seen for the first time how going and pursuing only the lowest price might have unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. And we have faced the situation, and I have faced the situation, for instance, with measles vaccines, now that you have mentioned, Vaccines examples in 2014, we have to exit the market because we need to take into consideration and with Amanda's comment around yellow fever, that these are very old vaccines, even seven decades. And in these seven decades, the regulation changes. And any time the regulation changes, we have to upgrade our manufacturing facilities. And it costs hundreds and millions of dollars and euros. And we are push to keep the same price until the situation is unsustainable. And we had to inform the WHO, PAHO, all the organizations that in 2014, we presented a plan to exit the missiles and now we are facing missile shortage around the world. And if we go to UNICEF webpage, it's very easy to break down who are the suppliers and the share of the supply, just to keep in mind that example. Concerning generics, companies like Sanofi has taken over large generics companies in the world. And in the case of Colombia, which I know very closely, we have been very, very proactive in coming to the to regulatory agency and do our quality check. And that very often, this proactivity put us in a difficult situation, in a biased situation. And I will give one example because to the thoughts I would add pharmacovigilance and traceability. I remember very well a forum that I was representing the big pharma in Colombia on Pharmacovigilance Forum. And I presented all the statistics and I was continuously questioned about the number of pharmacovigilance reports of our medications. And my question to the panel was, probably the reason of that is because we are reporting more. In the case of pharmacovigilance, if I, as a Sanofi employee, I don't report a serious adverse event in 24 hours, I'm out of the company. It's like that. It's one of the most serious issues in the pharmaceutical company. So we not only need to strengthen pharmacovigilance, but in the other side, with leaders like you, I would advocate for traceability. Pharmacovigilance traceability. Nowadays, pharmacovigilance is mainly driven by international non proprietary names. And it is extremely difficult to differentiate A from B. Mm -hmm. So yes, we have to do surveillance. But surveillance are targeted efforts. Mm -hmm. But it's not the routine. It's not the routine implemented by law in the regulation. So I would call to action for pharmacovigilance traceability, not only having the non proprietary name. We have been questioned very often Ah, you have a hidden commercial agenda around that. No. Today it's impossible to differentiate A from B in pharmacovigilance reports and to take the appropriate measures to see if we have to recall a medication or not. And we are doing that proactively. So I would like to leave this thought in the panel and call to action in these regards. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And in the back, please. Thank you. Um, Johnny Amenya, I work for JSI. Um, my background is a pharmacist, and I'm a supply chain actor. So, and way back in time, I used to do procurement at a national level in Ghana. 
So um, a number of some of the things I wanted to mention has just been touched on by a colleague. But I take a little bit of an exception to the local solutions. And, and I think that supranational bodies will be a better way to, to confront this issue, where what their edits on the quality issues become binding, not the non-binding pre-qualification schemes that have been used over the years, but a binding one. Because at the national level, the, the marketing interest is too directly linked. Uh, the systems are weak. We know how weak and corrupt most of the developing countries are. So if we can strengthen a supranational body entity to be the arbiter on quality, I think we might be, be on to something at, at that level. And I think the emerging trends of regional harmonization schemes, the, the free trade agreement at the continental level may give us an opening to confront some of these things. I also think that um, some of the issues about post-marketing uh, data gathering and surveillance and pharmacovigilance are key to ensuring that quality is maintained, and that quality loops back to that product, even being on the market or not. Um, when we have quality issues in one country, in one jurisdiction, other jurisdictions suddenly wake up and say, what's going on here? So why not take it to that global, elevate it above the national level? Um, I think that a big challenge, though, is the over-reliance on the manufacturers for the data that supports the quality and, and everything about this. And I, and I wonder what the panel think about this. What can we do to move that over-reliance? When, when I was a pharmacy student, what I learned was that when an ethical company develops a new product, they are the only ones who have the, the testing protocols for measuring quality of that product. So how can anybody else challenge their data? What can we do about that? Mm. You want to jump in, Amanda? Well, I mean, I, that's when I read your book, mm -hmm. the, the, that just jumped out at me so much that there's so much uh, that is an honor system that relies on trust, that we rely on manufacturer reports. And I mean, you know, it, at least in the case of clinical trials, generally speaking, it's happening with some university process. There's sometimes peer review, but we already know from other kinds of investigative journalism, that process is also rife with, with difficulties. And I think you know, if you look at the, the literature and documentation on the issues in clinical trials, we might take that same lens and look uh, further downstream at the market authorization, the data that is being submitted and used in those context. It seems to me like there could be easy ways um, with machine learning and AI to find where there are obvious problems in data. I mean, I think, I don't know if this Peter Baker was doing that when he was there in the background checking out the computers, but, you know, there, there are ways to spot real problems pretty easily. And, uh, you know, surely we could do a bit better on that. Anyhow, I, I agree with you. I think it's an, it's a, it strikes me as someone who's not from that field just how much uh, is about trust and honor system in, in, from the manufacturer themselves. Uh, I mean, you know, certainly as an investigative journalist, I'm always in favor of more disclosure. Um, but I think it's really surprising uh, how much is not, how much of the hand is not shown in this whole supply chain. And so if you think about um, you know, traceability, I think, which you had mentioned, and um, uh, it should be the norm that, that I mean, and, and you can just digitize the whole thing, you know, where's the API coming from? Um, how, you know, can you build in guarantees that the API wasn't swapped for a lower cost ingredient through traceability to make mm -hmm. sure that, you know, those API facilities were inspected and that you've got you can have markers in that material. And you know, what about um, the FDA publishing bioequivalence curves, you know, so that uh, so that the doctors and patients can look at the data? What about country of origin labeling on all of these products, which by the way, patients desperately want for you know finished dose and active ingredient? Um, so, you know, my feeling is that there is just tremendous amount that's hidden, it shouldn't be hidden, uh, the argument that it's proprietary is not adequate, uh, and that, that we should basically sort of 
turn a big Klieg light on this whole system and that it would improve uh, safety. I think it probably would improve the reliability of the data. And uh, I have to guess that it would improve patient outcomes. Mm -hmm. Sean. So I think, firstly, I agree that post-marketing surveillance with some sort of traceability, and I think we'll have to define very precisely what will that mean, um, is an important area to consider. But coupled with that would be the need to use new data science technologies, which can allow us to use post-marketing surveillance and pharmacovigilance data in ways that we have not been able to do in the past. And that means both country regulators, but also WHO and the Uppsala Monitoring Center, uh, it's worth exploring where can we use new data science technologies like what Amanda is mentioning. I think that could be a very fruitful area on post-marketing surveillance. Then back to think Johnny's comment. Um, I think supranational could mean many things. I mean, supranational could mean truly global, but supranational could also mean regional. And I think we, we do uh, at least are observing very closely from the sidelines the uh, AU resolution on the African Medicines Agency and you know what that will amount to and how that will um, how that will be structured mm -hmm. and so on. So I don't know if you're by supranational you necessarily imply global or it could be regional. If it's regional, it isn't in, in conjunction with what you know Javier was saying earlier as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any last questions? We have one question from Twitter. Oh, please. Um, this is from Anita Kishore. Uh, how can the global health community play a role in advocating for a higher quality supply chain, knowing the issue affects the global market beyond global health's usual scope? Hmm. Let's all look at each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, 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 th I was, that's why I mentioned the World Bank and the regional development banks, that their entire purpose is to work on these kinds of big uh, regulatory and economic issues that, uh, that anyhow, so I just think that they might have a role here, and, and their mandate obviously goes beyond the specific right. uh, global health mm -hmm. diseases. And you know, maybe someday global health will expand beyond, you know, our our big three plus uh, a bit on maternal and child health. Uh, I don't know. You you just came out of the Gates Foundation, Prashant. What what's your prognostication? Will we be working on diabetes and? Uh, other non-communicable diseases and global health in the coming years? So I think in some ways we, we are already starting to work on yeah. diabetes and, and non-communicable diseases, but I think the model, and this goes back to I think what Javier was saying, I don't think we can replicate the model that we've used for the three diseases at all. It'll have to be uh, much more lighter touch, much more global public goods provisioning for NCDs mm -hmm. or CBDs in particular, mm -hmm. and in a that's where more thought has to go in what those global public goods will be, which give us the highest return. And next generation global yes. health. Well, um, I want to thank all of our panelists and thank our audience. Um, we invite you to stick around for coffee and, and breakfast. Uh, Catherine will be signing some books for sale in the back as well. So please give a round of applause to our panel. Thank you.